dollars a year. Let's go live to Melbourne now. The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, joins us. Minister Frydenberg, thanks so much for your time. Can I first ask you about the GST? Why do you need to legislate this? Because a couple of months ago, the now Prime Minister was arguing that you could do this with an intergovernmental agreement. Well, it's very clear, Laura, that the current system was not sustainable. Uh, living in Western Australia and only getting 30 cents in the dollar was a pretty raw deal. Uh, so what we are going to do is to legislate a floor of 75 cents in the dollar. We're going to provide an additional $9 billion. And as a result, we're going to see all the states and territories better off. Now, we know that Bill Shorten just a few weeks ago mm. was in Western Australia talking about supporting the government in legislating uh, these reforms, uh, which we can do. Uh, through the federal parliament. Now let's see if he walks the talk. OK, but this looks like a uh, naked political grab here. Why should we see this as anything but trying to sandbag seats in West Australia in the lead-up to an election? Well, it actually flows from the Productivity Commission's report, uh, which showed that we do need a better system in place. And the system um, that we have landed on will leave every state and territory better off. And we do need a more sustainable GST system. It's more than just about WA. It's actually about ensuring um, the system stays fit for purpose uh, for decades to come. And the Commonwealth is stepping up with an additional $9 billion and the states will benefit as a result. So just w one more time, why do you have to legislate this? Why can't you stick to the intergovernmental agreement that you first thought was a good idea? Because the legislation will give certainty. Okay. Certainty going forward um, that this new uh, system uh, will, be, will leave the states and the territories better off and we won't see a repeat, Laura, of the situation where um, WA got only 30 cents in the dollar. Clearly an unfair system. So a lot of work has been done through the Productivity Commission. A lot of work was done by Scott Morrison when he was Treasurer. Uh, I think he's reached a really good outcome here. And as a result, the Commonwealth is taking the lead and we expect the Labor Party uh, to follow suit. And so have you written to your counterpart on Labor's side? Have you written to Chris Bowen asking whether Labor will support this? And when do you intend to put the legislation forward? Is it the first order of priority in the next sitting week? Well, we certainly will be bringing it in in the next sitting period. Uh, and Scott Morrison will be writing to Bill Shorten with a copy of the legislation like I will be uh, with the state treasurers. Uh, but let's not forget, just a few weeks ago, Laura, uh, Bill Shorten was saying that he will follow the government. Uh, he will follow the government in legislating this. So it'd be a bit odd for him to now walk away from his comments just a few weeks ago. So you've adopted Labor's policy, essentially, Josh Frydenberg. Is that what no, you're saying? No, they adopted ours, Laura. Okay, uh, it okay. Was, it was Scott Morrison as treasurer uh, who came up with this reform plan and deserves a lot of credit for it. And it's now Scott Morrison as Prime Minister who is seeking to legislate it. Let me ask you about the Royal Commission now. We saw that interim report on Friday. It was damning as we expected. I didn't think we should be as shocked by that, given the evidence we've seen over the last couple of months. Now, there's focus on the extension or a need to extend the Royal Commission beyond February 1 of next year. Are you open to that? Have you given the Commissioner the, the permission to do that? Has he said to you that he might need more time? No, he hasn't, but we've made very clear, the Prime Minister and I, uh, that if the Royal Commissioner asks for more time, then he will be granted that. Uh, you would expect us to do so. Uh, at the same time, uh, he has conducted a very rigorous, comprehensive and professional process to date. Uh, they've taken uh, more than 9,000 submissions, and all of which have been read. And anybody who has looked through this 1,000-page interim report from the Royal Commissioner uh, would be left in no doubt uh, that he has taken his role very seriously, and he has also said that he wants to deal uh, with, his, uh, with these issues uh, promptly. Uh, he doesn't want to have a situation where there's un ongoing uncertainty for the sector, yeah. And we recognise um, that he has more important work to be done, uh, to do, but we have already seen uh, a very frank and scathing assessment 
of the culture, the compliance and the conduct mm. uh, in the banking system uh, where he has made it very clear that basic standards of fairness and honesty have gone out the door in the pursuit of profits and greed. Now, Josh Frydenberg, you say you don't want to impose heavy regulation on the banks and financial institutions in the wake of this uh, Royal Commission, but from the evidence, it's clear that maybe the banks do require that. So how do you uh, make sure the banks don't do the wrong thing into the future, um, but, but whilst also not putting a handbrake on the economy and dampening uh, competition? What are your ideas in this space? Well, one of the real takeouts of the report uh, was that of the misconduct identified, uh, it was already in breach of existing laws. Uh, and the Royal Commissioner makes very clear, Laura, that ASIC, as the regulator, uh, was not enforcing the law uh, in the way that it should have. Mm. Uh, it was pursuing more negotiation as opposed to litigation, even though its success rate in cases was above 90%. Uh, so the issue is not necessarily, according to the Royal Commissioner, mm. uh, whether we have the right laws in place. The issue more is, are we enforcing the law properly? And the Royal Commissioner himself says uh, that perhaps having a simpler uh, uh, set of laws, which very clearly sets out uh, what is required of those uh, in the financial mm. sector to follow that law, may be better than adding, in his words, another layer of regulation and complexity. So we'll watch uh, his final recommendations very closely yeah. and obviously we will uh, do whatever is necessary to ensure that this conduct doesn't happen again and that consumers are put first and get better outcomes mm -hmm. Uh, in, in the future than they but have think, in the past. But Treasurer, things can change now before we even see this final Ro Royal Commission yes. uh, report. And I know you have put in place a number of things, but two things uh, out of the, the answer you, you just gave. You say that ASIC has been uh, more willing to negotiate a settlement with those big banks doing the, the wrong thing rather than um, litigate. Would you like to see ASIC change their uh, thinking on this? Would you like to see ASIC prosecute and go right through the legal process rather than negotiate. And what about funding? I mean, there was a previous uh, Prime Minister who ripped out funding for ASIC. Should that be returned? Actually, we've increased the funding uh, for ASIC uh, to the tune of $190 million. Uh, and we've also given ASIC the ability uh, to raise uh, money from, from industry uh, mm -hmm. because those who are being regulated should help pay for, pay for that regulation. Um, what we want to see is ASIC uh, be less timid and enforce the law. Uh, that is a clear message out of this interim report. I spoke over the weekend uh, to the ASIC uh, head, uh, James Shipton. He's very conscious of what needs to be done. There is an internal review going on uh, by um, the new special prosecutor, Daniel Crennan QC, to look at the way ASIC uh, enforces the law. But let me be very clear, ASIC will have the resources necessary to do the job to ensure that the public get better outcomes mm. than they have to date from the financial system. Treasurer, what's your assessment of the Royal Commission and the effect it has had on the economy? Do you agree with the assessment that it has led to, I guess, uh, tighter lending standards and therefore has pushed property prices down? Well, in terms of tighter lending standards, uh, this is a consequence of a number of things. In particular, APRA uh, have reined in investor loans uh, and made it more difficult uh, for, uh, for, for large loans to be given to investors in the property market. Uh, and that has had a subsequent impact on, on prices. And we've seen uh, housing prices, particularly in the capital cities, of Sydney and Melbourne come back to uh, more sustainable levels and the RBA has said that that's a, healthy, uh, that's a healthy outcome. But at the same time, we've got the Labor Party promising a new property tax uh, with their removal of, of negative gearing, which will then uh, impact more greatly on the value of people's homes. That's not a good outcome uh, for Australian families either. So we'll watch very closely. 
um, what is happening in the housing market, but at the same time we'll watch very closely uh, the recommendations from uh, the, the Royal Commissioner and ensure that they're implemented mm. in a way um, that enhances competition, doesn't constrict it, and in a way that enhances the economy and doesn't restrict it. Treasurer, just a few uh, quick things on uh, the budget. We saw the final budget outcome revealed yeah. uh, last week. The, uh, the best set of budget figures in a decade. What fiscal rules are you abiding by? Are you sticking with the rules set down by Scott Morrison uh, as uh, when he was Treasurer? Any uh, new spending will be offset uh, by savings? Are these, you know, ironclad rules or are they a little blurry sometimes? No, the rules haven't changed and they've served us well, uh, and when ministers come to the table, they're expected uh, to have offsets. Uh, we have, as you say, uh, seen a really good set of numbers. We had the national accounts a few weeks ago, which showed that the Australian economy was growing 3.4% through the year. It was broad-based growth, Laura, uh, with household consumption up, uh, with uh, dwelling uh, construction up, with business investment up, with exports up and with government spending on infrastructure, well, both in, the Commonwealth and the state level In that sense, level then, up. Treasurer, do you rule out an early return to surplus? What we've made clear is we're still on track for a balanced I mean, budget but, but with a small surplus in 1920. The story that you tell just shouldn't that, you know, lend a weight to this idea that you could hand down a, an early surplus if you wanted to? Well, there are, there are some challenges out there, yeah. uh, challenges globally. Uh, but also domestically, we've seen uh, a terrible drought, uh, which is really hurting uh, particular communities in New South Wales and Queensland with knock-on effects elsewhere. Uh, and we've also uh, agreed to provide more uh, funding into the school sector and, as we talked about earlier, um, with, with the GST. Uh, so we are, uh, we are ensuring that uh, needs are met across the community, but we're also growing the economy and, Laura, those national accounts show that the Australian economy is growing at its fastest rate since the height of the mining boom in 2012. We've had Standard & Poor's reaffirm Australia's AAA credit rating in the past week, and now we've produced the final budget outcome, which was the best in the decade. So we cannot afford risking this strong economy with its good momentum, with Labor's tax and spend approach and $200 billion of new taxes and more budget deficits and debt from the Labor Party that we've seen in the past because, as you know, the last time they produced a budget surplus, the Berlin Wall was still, was still standing. <laughs> OK. Bit of history there too. Josh Frydenberg, before I let you go, one final question. Tim Sora wants US-style confirmation hearings for any new ABC board members. A good idea? Will you consider it? We have a comprehensive process in place uh, and, uh, you know, I haven't heard uh, a powerful reason to change that. So that's a no? Well, I haven't heard a powerful reason from Tim Saw or elsewhere um, to change that. We have a comprehensive system in place, but no doubt um, you know, I would leave, uh, I would leave a, um, it to Mitch Fifield as the relevant minister But it would uh, stop political appointments, wouldn't it? But the point is we want the best people for the job. And the best people uh, for the job are uh, have a you know, deal of expertise from across the economy and from across the community. Josh Frydenberg, thanks for your time this morning. Always good to join you, Laura. The Treasurer there, live from Melbourne. Let's